but you. We, we grow up <laughs> doing things that we're not supposed to do. And probably up until I was about 15 years of age, um, I thought that my name was, this is the last time I'm going to warn you. I, I, I did. I, thought, I mean, my father was constantly, and if it wasn't my father, it was my sisters looking at me going, this is the last time I'm going to warn you. I got to school. They said, write your name. I said, it's really long. I don't know if it'll fit in the space. What's your last name? You. What? Yeah, that's the last word my father ever says to me when he says my name. I remember growing up, and, and, and I was a, a, bit of a, a bit of a hellion. I've shared that before. And I would come home, and my father would be standing there, and he'd look at me. He goes, look at what? Go look in the mirror. Look at what you look like. Look at what you're doing. Is this an indication of how you want to present yourself to everybody who sees you? Now, I'm going to tell you this, Leonard. This is the last time I'm going to warn you because there are going to be repercussions for the actions and activities that you participate in. You know, we have choices uh, that we can make in our lives literally from sunup to sundown. Now, what choices do you make in light of the consequences that will occur? And I think that's really uh, the big question that we have to ask ourselves. You know, we, we have a penal system in our country that... Um, is housing way too many men and women. Why? Because the choices that they have made have resulted in consequences that are putting them away from their families, from a life that they should be living, a life of abundance in Christ Jesus. It's sad. Open your Bibles with me this morning to Jeremiah. We're continuing in our series a full throttle, this incredible roller coaster ride with the prophet Jeremiah. We're going to cover an inordinate amount of text this morning, so get ready. Um, we're going to begin in chapter 4, so get to Jeremiah. We're in chapter 4. If you remember the last time we got together, we finished in chapter 4, verse 4, so we're going to begin in verse 4. Five, and we're going to run all the way through chapter 6 to the end. Okay? So we're going to cover a lot of text, and this is one of the reasons why I'm trying to encourage all of you to be reading Jeremiah all week long so that you understand where it is that we're going to be. I'll use an example. You know, I'm taking uh, Systematic Theology 3, uh, this semester. My professor has us do all this reading prior to the lecture so that when he gets to the lecture, we know what's going on. That's what I'm asking all of you uh, to do. Uh, pray for me because I didn't do well on my test yesterday. I was very disappointed in myself. I, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, you, you always, always take your first choice. I changed my mind three different times and got all these questions wrong. It was terrible. Um, I said, nah, you know, true and false, sometimes they're really tricky. If it, you, you miss one word, it just, yeah, it wasn't a good experience yesterday. So um, we're going to be in verse 5, beginning in verse 5 of chapter 4. We're going to read some text. We're not going to read all the text, obviously. As we hit some highlights, we're going to read the text that makes, important, uh, makes it important. I would probably say to you in chapter 5, verses 7 and 9, that's a key point for, for us today. And, and it, it is relative to where we are as a country, where we are as a people group, and the results of what is going on. Now, um, this morning, uh, we're going to hear uh, the word of God as it was spoken to who? To the nation of Judah. Remember, Israel's already been taken care of. God has had his way. And um, there is 
Uh, no, uh, there, is, uh, there is going to be three things that we're going to see this morning. There is going to be warning, a reason for the warning, and the judgment that will come after the warning. So those are really our three points. The warning, the reason, and the judgment is coming. This is what we're going to cover in verses 4, 5, and 6. And I, and I want to, again, impress upon you that it is so important to recognize where you are in your specific life individually so that when you make choices in your life, remember there are repercussions for the choices that you make. So, um, as we go, listen, the last time we were together, last week we, we had a great weekend of baptism and we talked about missions and, and just the importance of what it means to bring the gospel, right? So we see Jeremiah is going out into uh, Judah and what is he doing? In, in essence, he is preaching the gospel. He's preaching repentance, that they should turn, somebody please turn from your wicked ways because God's wrath is coming. But he loves us so much, he's giving us the opportunity to turn. Won't you hear his word, right? Jeremiah, we talked, you know, he's this young kid. He's like, how am I going to do this? And God looks at him and says, you're not doing anything. I will do it through you. You might be persecuted. You might be hated. You might be called a traitor. All of those things are real. It is no different than the way people look at us. Do you know that? As we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, they hate us. They persecute us. We're fortunate in this country, but if you leave this country and go to some other places, you go to jail. At the funeral on Tuesday, I ran into a buddy of mine who I had not seen for years. And we traveled together to India in 2005. And he said, Lenny, you've got to pray for us because the new government in India is a radical Hindu government. They are persecuting Christians like there's no tomorrow. I can't post anything on Facebook. I have to go incognito when I'm over there. Okay? And he's Indian. He is from an area in India called Kerala, the southern point of India. And um, he's got a Bible school. He's got an orphanage. They're trying to close his orphanage down because it's a Christian orphanage. This is the world that we live in. And so the last time we were together, we were told of the desperate sin problem in Judah. And we heard of the idol worship. Remember, they were going to Baal and they were idol worshiping and doing all of those things. Um, and, and it was consuming them. It, it was so typical historically. We, 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 we study history so that what? So that we don't necessarily repeat it. But you know what? The, the nation of Israel and Judah, what did they do? They saw the history. They saw what was going on. And they were doomed to repeat. And that's kind of where we were. They were urged to repent so that God would bless them. Jeremiah says, listen, if you would just repent, God will wrap his arms around you and we can begin the process of moving forward. But that's not what they wanted to do. And so here is where we are as we begin chapter 4, verse 5. This idea of disobedience and the consequences of for that disobedience. Now, we're going to go back a little bit and we're going to get uh, into all of this, but I want you to go to chapter 5, verse 7. I want you to listen to this, okay? Just this, from verse 7 to 9. He says, why should I pardon you? God is speaking to Judah. Why should I pardon you? Your sons have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not God. A little g. And when I had fed them to the full, what did they do? They committed adultery and trooped to the harlot's house. That was a prostitution house by, the, by Baal. Okay? That, and they would go to that place. They were well-fed, lusty horses, each one neighing after his neighbor's wife. Think about this. This is what's going on, 
All right? Shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord, and on a nation such as this shall I not avenge myself? This is God's word. Look at our country today. Look at what is going on around us today. That three little verses, those three little verses, verse 7, 8, and 9 of chapter 5, that is the picture that you can take of what is going on in this nation today. For a second I was scrolling and I saw a roast that they were doing for Alec Baldwin. And in this roast, you know what they were doing? They were praising Bruce Jenner, whatever, about all of this great stuff that he has done. That is exactly what God is talking about in verses 7, 8, and 9 of chapter 5. So let's take a look. Let's go back for a second now to chapter 4 as we look through this. And here is the warning. He gives us a warning. In verses 5 and 6, in 5 and 6 he says, the alarm is being sounded. He gives people notice. If you don't think God is a God of love, then we got to take a step back and reevaluate whether or not you call yourself a Christian. And I, I'm being dead serious. Because what, what the world wants you to believe is that he's a God of hate, right? Oh, look at what I'm going to do to these people. I'm going to smite them. I'm going to punish them. I'm going to... Why would he let the flooding of Imelda happen? He didn't know let that happen. It happened. You know, why are all these people in jail? If we, if we served a, loved a loving God like you talk about, why are all these people incarcerated? Well, he didn't put them in prison. Did he? Listen to what he says in verse 5. He says, because of the evil of your... I'm sorry. Verse 5, declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpet in the land, cry aloud and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified cities, lift up a standard toward Zion Seek refuge, do not stand still, for I am bringing evil from the north and great destruction. He warns them. He warns them. But you see, he gives them a way out. God always gives us a way out. He says, look, here's what's going on. This is what you've been doing. Okay? If you don't change your ways, this is the last time I'm going to warn you. That's our sermon title today. It's the last time I'm going to warn you. But he gives, gives all of us every opportunity to turn from our wicked ways. Right? What does it say? In, and we'll get to it. I'm jumping ahead. But in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, right? If my people who are known by my name would turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I will hear them from heaven. Then I will hear them from heaven. So the alarm is being sounded. And then in verses 7 through 9 of chapter 4, the enemy is, is before us and they will destroy. He tells them, a lion has gone up uh, from his thicket and a destroyer of nations has set out. He has gone out from his place. And he goes on and on and on and he says, look, I've set it all up. They're coming in. So you better stand up, blow the trumpets, and figure out a way to get out. Well, what's the way to get out? What do we say to people who we know are not believers? Here's the way out. Here's the, out, the way out from destruction. The way out of destruction is through Jesus Christ. Because he is the giver of life. Why? Because he took the sin of the world. Literally, the sin of the world upon his shoulders. Martin Luther wrote about that, about being free. Okay, even though he wasn't free. It, it took him all this time while he was studying in the monastery to literally figure out that he couldn't do anything in his own strength to earn, <clears throat> excuse me, to earn grace. He could not do anything. That grace was free. Why? Because Christ literally took his sin and went to the cross. That's what he did. 
And so God is telling the nation of Judah, look, turn away, repent, because I'm sending the wrath. I am sending the wrath. Jeremiah tries to call uh, out Judah, um, you know, for, for uh, God. And, and um, you know, he doesn't want them to suffer. It hurts them if you look at verses 10 through 12. Listen, here's what's going on. And it's no different than today. False prophets are misleading us. We, we are more concerned in what the media has to say. We all joke about this idea of fake news and everything like that. All the news is fake. It's all, it's all swayed in whatever direction and theme that they want to present to all of us. It's very easy for uh, heretical preachers to get up and make you believe a piece of scripture that they take out of context and build an entire theology around it. It's very easy to do that. That's why I always say to you, keep me in check. If I miss a point or misappropriate God's word, you need to hold me accountable to that. I'm human. I'm infallible. I'm not infallible. Sorry. I'm not infallible, right? I make mistakes, right? So he says, listen, in verse 10, Jeremiah complains. He, listen, he says, then I said, oh, Lord God, Surely you have utterly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying you will have peace, whereas a sword touches the throat. He says to God, he complains, he laments. Why, did, why is Jeremiah the weeping prophet? We, we're going to see. I mean, he's known as the weeping prophet. He cries out. God says, listen, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. You know, I still love you. I, I, I still want you to be my people but there are consequences for the decisions that you're making. <clears throat> it is this hot idea in verses 11 and 12, this idea of, of this ensuing judgment that is taking place. And it's scary. And, and it's scary for us. I, I'm going to keep going back and forth in terms of who we are today as a nation, who we are today as a group within the confines of Sawdust Road Baptist Church. Why? Because if we are not serving the Lord the way that God has called us to serve the Lord, there are repercussions for what it is that we do. Now you might say, well, that's not the loving God that I know about. That's not what the, those preachers talk about. God wants the best thing in the world for you. Of course he does. But if you're acting against God, what do you think? He's going to overlook that? When, when I went against my dad, you think he overlooked that? When you went against your parents and didn't listen to what they had to say, did they, were there repercussions for the actions in which you took? Some of you were angels, I know that. Never made a mistake. Never. Verses 13 through 18 is, is critical. L listen to this. He says, Behold, he goes up like clouds, and his chariots like the whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us if we are ruined. But verse 14, Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem. Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem. Repent! Repent and know that God will forgive you. Because he is a loving God. He says, he says uh, uh, repent basically that you may be saved. How long will your wicked, way, uh, wicked thoughts lodge within you? We live in a country today that is in the midst of wicked ways. How long? Do you think for one second, just like Judah thought, we got nothing to worry about. God loves us. We're, part, we're chosen, right? I spent my entire life and, and most part of my adulthood believing that I was one of the chosen people. It didn't matter what I did. I was good to go. Well, yeah, until he showed me how, what could happen when you turn away, when you are not following what God would want for you. And he gives them the opportunity. He says, if you would turn from your wicked ways, you'll be saved. You will be saved. Listen, in verses 19 through 22, 
It is this incredible lament of Jeremiah. And then you get the Lord's uh, response. And, and in these verses, this is really the cross that Jeremiah bears, right? Uh, he says, my soul, my soul, I am in anguish because he sees what's going to happen. He understands the movement that God is making. Why? Because God is talking directly to him. He is speaking through him and to him. To who? To the nation of Judah. And he goes and sends him into Jerusalem, no different than he sent Jonah into Nineveh and said, just go through the streets and preach repentance. The difference is those in Nineveh believed and he spared them. Those in Judah did not. And that's a problem. And he goes on, he says, uh, 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 my heart is pounding in me. I cannot be silent because you have heard Oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. He's warning them. That's how much he loves them. Even in the midst of their disobedience, God says, I, 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 I'm going to warn you. This is the last time, but I'm going to warn you. My father would shake his finger at me. It's the last time I'm going to tell you. What's going to happen if you, if, if you have to tell me again? And then he would break out the belt and he'd snap it. Okay, I get the picture. And, and I didn't want to have the welts that could apparently get there. In verses 23 uh, 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 through 31, he says, You will feel my hand upon you. Listen, if you don't get your act together, if this nation does not get their act together has nothing to do with the political movement in this country. That's not what I'm talking about. Because whoever is in, in, in uh, political authority is going to be in political authority. It does not change who we are in Christ Jesus. It does not change the message that we have been charged to go out and bring to the, to the lost of the world. Whether it's a Democrat, a Republican, a Socialist, it doesn't matter. They are not the gods. Okay? There is only one God. And that was the problem that Judah was having. They, they, were, they were going after all these other gods that were human gods, that were made up gods, that, that were perishing. And they forgot about the only living God, the one who truly gave them life. And so sin and rebellion against God leads to what? To darkness and chaos. This uh, verse 23, basically 23 through 26, what it does is really pretty amazing. It almost gives you a reversal of Genesis 1. He's lit, if you read it, right, and you go back to Genesis 1, uh, in the beginning, right, he, he, makes, he makes the heavens and the earth. Well, here he talks about, I looked on the earth and behold, it was formless. If you go back to Genesis 1, he says the, the uh, things were formless, but I gave them form. Now he's taking it away. He's being very clear, right? He, I looked at the earth and behold, it was formless and void, and the heavens and they had no light. In Genesis, he talks about giving light. But Judah has been so disobedient, he's, he's taking it all away. He's taking it all away. The world that we live in is no different. Bear with me, I got a bit of a sore throat. <clears throat> and so um, destruction, destruction is happening, but God's love will never forsake them. In verses 27 through 31, for thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation Here's the key in verse 27. You ready? Yet I will not execute a complete destruction. I'm going to punish you. There are ramifications for the, for the choices that you have made, but I'm not going to completely destroy you. See, different... So you, you remember when I think Saul goes... I think it was Saul goes out, and he says, listen, I want you to kill everybody. I want even the animals. I want them all dead. I want his family dead. 
I want his animals dead. I want them dead. And Saul takes it upon himself and says, nah, you know, there's a couple of good calves here. I, I want the, this, the king to remember, you know, what I did to him, right? He's very upset about that. But when God says, I'm going to destroy you, but yet I will leave a remnant. I will leave a remnant and I will take them to the next level. But I'm going to have to purge. It's basically what's going on, right? So destruction is happening, but God's love will never forsake them, nor will it, he forsake us. So when people come up to you and say to you, if your God is such a loving God, my God is a loving God. I'm still here and I still have breath to be able to share the love of who he is. Don't blame God for choices that you made. You made those choices. So here's the reason, right? Chapter 5, verses 1 through 31. Here's the reason. In verses 1 through 6, he talks about this idea there are none righteous. Not one. Where, where have you heard that before? Romans what? Somebody, come on. There is none righteous, not one. Romans 3, chapter, ten, uh, um, th chapter 3, verse 10. There are none righteous, not one. That means every one of us is a sinner. And the only thing that gets us to where we're going is the grace of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are what? Death. He's painting this entire picture in the first six verses of the reason why it is that he's doing what he's doing. There are none righteous, not one. These, these are, listen, uh, Jeremiah is basically talking in parables here. Him and Ezekiel are the only two that really, in the Old Testament, that talk about parables like this, right? And, and he says, um, Rome... Uh, to and fro uh, through the streets of Jerusalem and look now and take note and seek in her open squares. If you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, then I'll pardon her. None. There's none righteous. Not one. At the end of verse 3, it's really a picture of who we are today. And here's the deal. It says they refuse to repent. We as a nation refuse to repent. We've taken God out of every single thing that we could take God out of, and we don't understand why we are in the situation that we're in. They have refused to repent. It's scary. It's wrong. He says in, in verse 5, I will go to the great and will speak to them, for they know the way of the Lord and the ordinance of their God, but they too, with one accord, have broken the yoke. Even the priests, even the leaders, even these people who profess to be with the Lord are speaking their own language. They're doing their own thing. It, it's, it's no different than when those two came up to, to Jesus and said, hey man, I don't understand. We preached in your name. We did all these things. We healed in your name. He says, get away from me. I never knew you. Because it was for self-gratification. It had nothing to do with the furtherance of the word of God. It was for them. We got to stop doing stuff for ourselves and start doing things for God. That's what we need to do. Somebody write that down for me because I apparently forget that quite a bit. <clears throat> Verses 7 through 9 that we read, here was the key. And here is a picture of what our, our country looks like today. It is a country filled with immorality and it's everywhere. It's everywhere. You think that God is not going to come down and do something to this nation because we're the United States of America? 
Look at what he did to the people that he has a covenant with. You think he's not going to tell us and show us and punish us the way that we deserve to be punished? Turn from your wicked ways, repent and call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. That goes for everybody. Everybody. It doesn't matter what you think. Well, that's all good for you. I got plenty of friends and family that say, Lenny, I'm really glad that's good for you. No. It's good for everybody. It is the only thing that will save you. It is the only thing that will keep you from eternal darkness. That's it. And so we move forward and we say in verses 10 through 18, the enemy has been given permission to destroy, but to not do it completely. Again, God says, I'm giving them permission to come in. Not only am I giving them permission to come in and to destroy you, I'm going to send you to a nation that's going to lord over you, and they're going to speak a different language than you speak, so you can't even understand. It's going to make life absolutely miserable for you. Don't think it can't happen. Israel and, Israel and Judah in verses um, 11 through 13, Israel and Judah scoffed at Yahweh. L -l listen to this. Um, he goes, For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, declares the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, not, her, not he. Misfortune will not come to us. No way. Look at it, it's us. Come on. You sit here this morning, and, and, and many of you are nodding your heads and, and all of that, but you're going to go home, you're going to turn your television on, you're going to get on the Internet, and you're going to go about your day. Might do a little shopping, and you'll, you'll be fired up for 20 minutes that you're here, but what? You go about your life. And God is saying, we have to do this 24-7. We have to do it 24-7. In verses 14 through 18, the words of Jeremiah would wreak havoc on the unbelieving people. Havoc. This is what's going on as you look at this. Uh, Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire. He goes, when you speak this word, my words are going to be fire, and the people you're speaking to are going to be wood. What happens when you put fire on wood? It burns, doesn't it? I am going to wreak havoc upon you. Thus says the Lord. I know this is, I, I'm coming at you kind of hard this morning. But there's always a picture of beauty. And the beauty is the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, that has taken us over to the other side. And so, as we look at this in verses 19 through 24, we're almost there. The people had walked away and then wanted to know why the calamity was on them. Why are you doing this to me? What have I done? So I got, you know, I went up to, to that house, you know, that bow put around, you know. So what? I, I got three, four wives. I deserve it. So what? I could drink and, and party. Who cares that I, I got sick and it's all over there and, you know, just wipe my mouth and start drinking again. Why? Why calamity on me? Because God says you have forsaken me. And now, now you can serve foreign gods. Now you're going to see what it's like. The people were foolish. They listened to everyone but God. What do we do? We listen to what everybody else has to say except for the Word of God. If I were to take a poll here and ask how many of you read your Bible every single day, I guarantee not 100% of you would say that. I, I'm hard-pressed to believe 50% read their Bible every single day. There is going to come a time when you're not going to have your Bible to read. And if you don't know the Word of God and, and, and impart it onto your heart, 
you're, you're going to, it's going to be a sad, sad day. The people were foolish, and it's sad because that's where we are. And then in verses 25 through 31 of chapter 5, he says this, There is great injustice among my people. Not only are we forsaking God, we're not even treating one another like we should be treating one another. There's, there's this incredible amount of social injustice that's going on in our world today. I'm not talking about giving things to people that don't deserve. I'm talking about taking care of our own. We've got to take care of one another. Jesus was very specific. Love your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, with every fiber of your being, and do what second? Love one another. And God is talking to the nation of Judah and says, you're not loving one another. What's wrong with you? I've loved you from the beginning of time. I made a covenant with Abraham in which I have given you the keys to the kingdom and, and you're, doing, you're not doing the right thing. Do the right thing. Do it. There were corrupt leaders. There were false prophets. It is a shame, but this is the world as we knew it then. It is the world as we know it today. So here's the reason. That's the reason. He goes and gives them warning. He gives them a reason. Now we're going to see the judgment. What is this judgment really going to look like? There are 52 chapters in the book of Jeremiah. We're just in chapter 6 right now. And if this doesn't curl your hair, Jacob excluded, but if this does not curl your hair, I don't know what will. I, I don't know what will. The judgment is coming. Look at this. Who, who remembers the shadow? What evil lurks? All right? What evil lurks? Look at chapter, chapter 6. Flee for safety, O sons of Benjamin, from the midst of Jerusalem. Now blow a trumpet in Tekoa and raise a signal over Beth Hasarem. For evil looks down from the north. He even tells them where it's coming from. You're not going to be able to get away. You can run away, do whatever you want. But you know what? The mountains are going to quake, all this stuff. You're not getting away this time. I gave you all the warnings I was going to give you. Here's the judgment. You better run. But the dainty Judah had no defense. And here's the way I would uh, look at it. Jesus is our shepherd. He takes care of the sheep. Sheep are not the smartest animals on the face of the earth. They'll go wherever somebody leads them. And Judah was going where anybody would lead them. And so what? He's sending this power from the north. King Nebuchadnezzar is coming down. And he's going to rock their world. They're going to be a shepherd under the, they're going to be sheep under this shepherd. That's basically what God is saying. That Dany Judah had no defense. They had become like sheep, unable to tend to themselves. Literally. And in verses 6 through 8 of chapter 6, what does he say? He says, you're going to be punished. I hate to say it, but it is what it is, right? You are going to be punished. For thus says the Lord of hosts, cut down her trees and cast up a siege against Jerusalem. This is the city to be punished. What is mind-boggling to me is that Jeremiah is speaking out in Jerusalem to the nation of Judah and they don't hear him. Their ears are closed. For me, it's like turning off my hearing aids. <laughs> I hear nothing. So go ahead, talk to me till I'm blue in the face. You're blue in the face. It doesn't matter. You can't hear a word. That's the nation of Judah. 
That's the picture that you have to paint in your minds. This, this idea of a, a vivid description of the siege of Jerusalem. Terror should have filled their ears, but they were closed. Their ears were closed. The shameless people are going to feel the pain. Verses 9 through 15 talks about that. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts. And this is a dialogue right now in verses 9 through 15. It's a dialogue between Jeremiah and God. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, they will thoroughly glean as the vine of the remnant of Israel. What? He, they know that he destroyed Israel already. Pass your hand again like a grape gatherer over the branches. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? And here's the kicker. You ready? At the latter part of verse 10, he says, Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. We, we us today, have to again find delight in the word of God. If you find delight in the word of, the, of God, you will see a movement in your life that you never thought possible. When you go outside and the light of Christ shines, you, you, there's nothing like it. Susan and I were having a conversation yesterday. I got, you know, for me to get annoyed, it, it takes a lot. Maybe not. I don't know. But we were talking about some stuff. And I was annoyed. I was driving. We, we, we had torches and I was, last night, and I went to go pick it up. And I was driving. This person pulls in front of me. I put right on the horn. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? And the reason I did that was because I was angry about something else. It, was, it had nothing to do with that person. The shameless people will feel the pain, you know. And, and he goes on, he says, But I am full of the wrath of the Lord. I am weary, in verse 11, with holding it in. Pour it out on the children in the street and on the gathering of young men together for both husband and wife shall be taken, the aged and the very old. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and their wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. Oh my goodness. Folks, he's speaking to us. We have to turn from our wicked ways and repent. We have to repent. We need to drop down on our knees and repent. You know, in verses 10 through 15, Jeremiah can't believe the fact that they don't believe. We have seen it all. We've read it all. We see what's going on, and yet there is great unbelief in our land today. Verses 16 through 21 is very specific. And, and it says, turn and there is hope. He's not a God of wrath. He's a God of love. But there are consequences. And he says to us, if we would turn, there is hope. Turn and there is hope. God gives us a way. Verse 16. Judah closes their ears and their eyes in verse 17. They simply won't listen. We are called as ministers of the gospel to bring the word out, to bring it forth. And whether the people want to hear it or not, we bring it forth in obedience to what God has called us to do and watch God move because of our obedience and not disobedience. And so he goes on and he says uh, in verses uh, 17, uh, 18 through 21, Basically, hey, folks, the wrath is coming. The, the, the wrath is coming. The enemy in verses 22 through 26, the enemy is coming. You better get out of the way. The enemy is coming. In verses 27 through 30, here we go. You ready? Listen to this. I have made you an assayer. Do you know what an assayer is? An assayer is a tester. 
That's what an assayer is. And it had to do with silver and, and that. They would test the, the metals. And so he calls Jeremiah out and he says, you are an assayer. You are the tester. Listen, I have made you an assayer and a tester among my people that you may know and assay their way. Test their way. All of them are stubbornly rebellious, going about as a tail-bearer. They are bronze and iron. They all, they, all of them are corrupt. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. In vain, the refining goes on, but the wicked are not separated. And it spoils the metal. They call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. Judah closes their ears and their eyes. The wrath is coming. The enemy is coming. The thankless job of the prophet. It's Jeremiah's job. It is our job. Not that we're prophets. But it is our job to go out and share the good news. And and part of that good news is making people understand that there are consequences for not choosing to be with Christ. Christ made it simple in John 14, 6. I say this verse. You should have it memorized by now. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one shall come to the Father except by me. That's it. You want gospel? There's the gospel. Repent and believe unto Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, that Jesus lived and died, and God rose him up on the third day to do what? To sit at the right hand of the Father? You will be saved. I close. The problem is this. The people would fall short. The people would fall short. The people here will fall short. Like children being warned by their parents, God is warning us in the same way he warned Judah. We must, you ready? We must repent. We must repent and turn from our wicked, deceitful ways and call on Jesus for salvation. There is wrath for those who reject the Savior of the world. There is no turning back. There is no excuse. There is nothing left anymore. You must turn from your wicked ways or you will not be saved. But oh, the joy of salvation. Oh, the joy of a loving God who sent His Son, to be the propitiation for us. The sin offering. He made him who had no sin to do what? To be sin for you and me. That's the glory of the message of the gospel that there is a way out. Open your ears. Open your eyes. Open your hearts to the loving God who has promised you eternity. That's my God. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, maybe you think you have. Maybe today is actually the day of your salvation. Perhaps today is the day that you take that information that you've had in your head and you transfer it to your heart and watch the transformation of the living God take you from darkness into the light. Stand with me, won't you? Russ, Jack, we're going to have a time of reflection Oh, the joy of the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Father, right now I pray for this church. I pray for uh, those who are not here today. I pray for those who perhaps were watching this morning that they might hear the word, the word of the living God who gives us a way out. That if we would turn from our wicked ways and repent, that the love of Christ would come into us and we would be saved, that we could literally walk out of darkness and into the light. Father, how I pray for each and every person here this morning as we continue in our time of reflection for those whom I call upon him.